everyone. So welcome to yet another episode of Marketing Demystified. Uh, I'm Harpreet, your host for the show. And I have Vikesh as my co-host. We have a very special guest, Sandeep, today, who is going to talk about retail marketing. Hi, Sandeep. Um, hi. So quickly, a quick round of introduction from myself. I'm Harpreet. I head marketing for Kangaroo Group. I have over 20 years of experience in marketing and um, other areas. And um, I have worked with institutes of uh, high repute, organizations of high repute, such as IBM, HCL, and American Express. Uh, as far as marketing demystified is concerned, um, this platform is a pro bono initiative primarily to understand different nuances of marketing from experts at both academia as well as industry. Uh, Vikesh, can you quickly introduce yourself? Sure. Thank you, Arpreet. Hello everyone, I'm Vikesh Dhyani. I am a publisher. I'm co-founder of a company called Oakbridge Publishing Private Limited. Uh, I have spent over 24 years in uh, book publishing industry and information solutions industry. I worked with organizations like uh, McGraw Hill, Pearson, and LexisNexis previously. Uh, I'm looking forward to an exciting conversation with our special guest, Sandeep, today, uh, along with our wonderful host, Harpreet. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Vikesh. Sandeep, request your introduction. Thank you, Harpreet and Vikesh, for uh, um, introducing me. Uh, sorry, calling me onto this platform. Uh, it's been a while uh, we have been discussing about uh, coming on board, marketing demystified, and, and talking about uh, some aspects of marketing. Uh, and, and I'm finally glad that I could make it here, and for the invite as well. So I am um, a marketer with over a dozen years of experience. I have worked with uh, brands like uh, Head and Shoulders and Dettol. Uh, with companies like Procter & Gamble and Reckitt uh, in Singapore and the United Kingdom. Uh, I spent about seven years working there, moved back to India, worked on uh, brands like Tata Group's uh, Himalayan Mineral, Natural Mineral Water. And my last stint in corporate uh, field was with Swiggy, where I was the marketing director for their private brands division. So I set up the entire marketing team uh, for Swiggy's private brands division and ran it uh, until COVID. Uh, afterwards, I've been, uh, I've sort of split my time as a brand consultant, as well as uh, uh, today, but uh, the role that I'm handling is, is, is the head of marketing for uh, Pinner Brands, uh, which is a, a startup, a bootstrap startup based out of Bangalore. And what we do are two things. One, we connect marketers to startups. Um, and startups who are in need of marketers, we connect uh, senior director level to CMO level uh, marketers uh, with those startups. And we also have an academy section where we teach applied marketing, which sort of ties us back to, or rather brings us back uh, to the point of discussion today about retail marketing and about those aspects of marketing, which um, sad, sadly enough are not really taught in a practical applied sense in universities and uh, in the academia uh, uh, these days. Certainly, they were not taught when I was learning. I graduated from IIM Bangalore. Uh, retail marketing, for instance, was a dry academic subject, uh, which we had to compulsorily take as part of our coursework, uh, you know, for credits uh, during that time period. But the kind of marketing, retail marketing specifically that I learned handling head and shoulders shampoo brand across seven Southeast Asian countries over a period of four or five years. And then with Dettol and uh, Himalayan natural mineral water, those were the kind of practical lessons which I never got to learn in an academia setting. And uh, looking back, I can connect a lot of the theory with the practice now. But uh, when I graduated, I was I was completely hopeless. I just knew the theory part, which was which soon proved uh, inadequate in the real world. So that's what we are trying to do with the academy part of Winner Brands: you know, connect people to knowledge which can be useful for them, especially in a marketing context, uh, immediately afterwards. So that's uh, a short intro of who I am and what I do. Sure, thank you, Sandeep. So. I think there, uh, your uh, motto and our motive uh, overlap somewhere because um, we are also trying to do the similar thing. Exactly. So, yeah. So thanks a lot for uh, agreeing to come on this show and um, we look forward to an exciting conversation. So let's begin. The topic on which we are going to deliberate today is retail marketing. Mm -hmm. So I'll request you to kindly share your screen and uh, enlighten the audience with your thoughts on the subject. So a few caveats before we begin. 
uh, retail marketing is is a topic which is extremely vast. Uh, you know, most universities take a entire three month semester uh, to you know teach it uh, to the students. So a lot of it will not be stuff that we can cover during a one hour conversation. Uh, so what I've tried to do for this presentation at least is to keep it to those interesting parts which make retail marketing come alive uh, for a marketer as well as for a consumer. And uh, look at those fundamentals which actually drive the world of retail marketing. And the second caveat is even within the broader field of marketing, retail marketing has a um, slightly unsexy look and feel to it. It is not the kind of marketing that a lot of marketers themselves um, want to start out with. Uh, because it's it's not uh, it's it's very often and especially in a country like India, it's very often uh, equated to haggling with retailers over trade margins, uh, working with the sales team to determine what the monthly or the quarterly budget uh, for trade marketing needs to be, and so on and so forth. But the fact is, there's a lot of consumer insights and nuanced marketing concepts at play in retail marketing if you try to understand and dive into the depths of it. That's what I'll try and bring out a little bit today uh, during today's conversation. I think and before third... you move to the, sorry, I was going to say, uh, yeah, I yeah. thought you finished what you were saying. Before we move to the slide, this particular slide is excellent. It just makes me go to shopping right now. And that is, that is part of um, <laughs> what we will be talking through, right? Because there are ways of bringing retail marketing alive, even from a marketer's point of view, which a lot of marketers don't really try out today. For instance, um, in, um, in in Reckitt, uh, the UK headquarters, as well as uh, PNG Singapore headquarters, there are rooms that are set up specifically like supermarkets and discount stores and uh, in, in, in an Indian context, Kirana stores or what's known as high frequency stores outside of India. Uh, and marketers, whenever they are planning to launch a new product or a new uh, campaign, often have to walk the senior leadership through how that product, new product would be shelved, where it will be shelved, what the messaging on the uh, uh, violators and shelf strips, etc. would be. We'll talk about all that later. Uh, but they have to actually take the team through how it would look like in a neighborhood Kirana store, the product and, and uh, um, its, its look and feel. And that's part of how you bring alive the context of retail marketing uh, in an FMCG environment. Now, this brings us to the second, uh, the third caveat that one large component of the final mile point of marketing that I have not really touched upon in this deck is the entire e-commerce uh, uh, bit because I I believe it requires a completely different uh, discussion altogether and and it would have been a humongous effort to try and combine uh, a traditional retail marketing deck with an e-commerce deck. It would have been just too much uh, for everyone to absorb. So we will be begin the uh, you know discussion with these three caveats, but bear in mind that at the end of the day, the way retail marketing works, whether it be inside a, a supermarket, uh, a big bazaar, a, uh, a DMART, or a high frequency Kirana store, mom and pop store, or on marketplaces like um, you know Amazon or Flipkart, the fundamental consumer behavior insights their uh, you know pain points extra do not change what changes are the specificities of the platform through which and the channel through which you reach those consumers so uh, you know uh, the the broad psychological aspects of marketing do not change they remain consistent over channels so with that we can begin it is just a simple definition of what retail marketing is um it's it's fairly uh, well known, but retail marketing is basically uh, you know, goods and services being sold to end users within the context of a shopping environment. They are typically called customers, um, you know, which is the trade part of it. So, if you are going to sell your product or i or initiative, is typically what it's called uh, called in the uh, industry. If you are selling in your initiative to uh, a big bazaar, for instance. That big bazaar uh, uh, agent who will be talking to you will be your customer. And someone, a consumer who buys a shampoo bottle from Big Bazaar, from your brand, will be your consumer. And you have to actually sell your brand idea and the concept to both these people. 
the customer first and eventually the consumer. And therefore, this uh, the entire concept of retailer marketing exists at the intersection of consumer behavior, which is purchase behavior, what drives their purchase at the end point, and trade or retailer behavior, because you have to make your product or service um, attractive from a revenue point of view to the retailer as well. And this, uh, this attractiveness can come in the form of trade discounts you give or a revenue sharing agreement you get into with your trade uh, partner. But at the end of the day, you, have, you as a marketer have to sell that story to them as well and not just the consumer. That's what makes retail marketing a little complex and more interesting than uh, simple direct to consumer selling. And um, if you think of brand marketing and retail marketing, this is the uh, the last sentence shows the basic difference between the two. Of course, I have simplified a lot uh, here, but at the end of the day, if you think of uh, something called the IDA model, which is awareness, interest, uh, desire, desire, and action. And action. Exactly. Uh, if you think of it in the, in that context, your brand marketing is what drives awareness and intent to purchase. Your retail marketing then comes in in the last mile, the last mile, and closes the deal with driving desire and action. Now, this it's interesting to note because a lot of the categories that uh, uh, work in retail marketing work really well in retail marketing are stuff like impulse purchases, right? And they don't really follow the IDA model. You don't really go through a funnel by driving awareness for a safety pin or uh, a candy bar, for instance. It happens with it starts rather with de driving desire at the point of sale. Uh, like you skip the first two components, uh, awareness and intent. You drive, you come directly to desire when you see the product, uh, you know, physically in front of you. And then that desire should lead to action. So this is basically the difference between a considered purchase and something like a, a, a impulse purchase. And an impulse purchase, um, and both actually considered an impulse purchase, the driving action at the point of sale is the most critical part at the end of the day because that's what will bring revenue. And that driving action requires a whole host of things, um, which we will dive into uh, in a structured fashion in the rest of the deck. And the thing is, if you look at retail marketing and this IDA model, and especially the action at the end of this entire uh, funnel, in in a broad manner, in a high level manner, it can become quite complex because you have multiple kinds of channels uh, from you know, convenience stores to retail stores, uh, to uh, mom and pop stores, to supermarkets, hypermarkets, franchise stores, direct uh, sales to consumers, etc. So this, that complexity can get quite overwhelming. So the, 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 there is a simple approach to it, which I've tried to capture in the next slide which if we can move forward, yeah. Okay, so um, I will come to that portion. Let's, let's uh, skip that second slide and go directly to retail marketing framework. This is basically a 2D2P framework. You can call it a D2P2 framework. It does not matter. What matters is the component parts of it. For it's, it's actually a combination of display, distribution, promotion, and price. Right, and we have all heard of the 4P framework of marketing, uh, which has been ex in existence for a long period of time. Uh, it's a classical format. It still works and therefore is still used. In a retail context, there is a slight change in that, in the sense like uh, um, the, the promotion and price portion still remain the same. Place is basically distribution. Right, and uh, what you have at the uh, the first portion is the display. Now, let's go through these one by one. The display part is basically fairly simple and is often the most attractive, visually attractive part of the uh, entire retail marketing framework. And Harpreet, uh, this is what you referred to in the first uh, bit, right? The the opening slide which we saw. You said you really felt like being there and picking something off of the shelf, and that display is what drives that desire to. Uh, explore further because a lot of marketing a lot of marketing and a lot of sales is also about interesting uh sorry driving visual. interest to the consumer visually. exactly visually so when you go inside like just think about it uh how many times have we gone into 
uh, hypermarket or a uh, or a mall, shopping mall, with the intent of buying just you know maybe groceries for the week, and ended up coming out with much more than we uh, intended to buy initially. Yeah, so it's that, of the time. Yeah, <laughs> that desire, that desire is uh, is mostly driven by display, um, and because human beings are inherently visual uh, uh, communicators. So everything from point of sale branding materials, display units, what's called freestanding units, uh, which are basically the sing singular portions that you see in the middle of uh, shop, store, uh, shop floors, with a lot of the products stacked together, often in attractive format. So since Christmas is coming up, uh, coming along now, uh, you will see a lot of uh, shampoo bottles or soap bars being stacked in the form of Christmas trees. Uh, in in a lot of these stores now, if if they haven't already done it, they'll be doing this over the next two weeks. So the intent of all of that is to create visually arresting displays, which will stop a consumer's movement through the store and have them con force them to consider the product. And that's that comes to the last part, the disruptive visibility of your brands in the planogram. Planogram uh, is a technical term. Uh, there's nothing too complex about it. It's basically a, vi a visual depiction of the arrangement of products um, uh, of multiple brands often within a store environment. Uh, that's that's what a planogram is. Uh, it is so when you walk into a store and see uh, Gillette razors in in one section, male grooming aisles, uh, your uh, uh, milk and dairy section and breakfast section and all arranged in a specific manner. All of that comes off of a planogram. The next portion, next portion of the framework is distribution, which is fairly uh, simple in the sense that uh, in retail marketing, there are two concepts of distribution that are really important, the width and the depth. Um, the width is basically the number of numerical outlets uh, that you are present in. So it's, it's basically called numerical distribution and weighted distribution in a retail uh, environment. So if you are, for instance, say a shampoo brand, and you have sachets of shampoos which are being sold at one rupee uh, or even lesser on discount, you'd ideally want your shampoo brand, uh, your sachets to be present in as many Kirana stores as possible, especially in tier two, tier three uh, environments where they are likely uh, you know, uh, to be purchased. So there the importance would be to get into as many stores as possible to cover as many uh, as, or uh, uh, to have as large a reach as possible with the number of outlets. So that's your numerical distribution. Weighted distribution is actually a more nuanced factor, which basically looks at which are the stores that I need to be present in so that most of my sales can happen from those stores. So the, that's that's the, actually, Sandeep, similar to value-weighted value -weighted distribution, right? So those but, stores which, can, which, which contribute most to the category, whether right. you are present in those stores or not. Exactly. You have, to, you have to be present in those stores and you have to be competitively present in those stores uh, as compared to your competition and you have to have high visibility within those stores. So, but as you said, all of that begins with the weighted distribution or value added distribution. Uh, the intention is, the, and the danger with following only numerical distribution is, you can be present in, uh, you know, 150,000 outlets across uh, uh, Maharashtra, for instance, but if those 150,000 outlets, uh, if in those uh, outlets you are present with only one or two SKUs, that's a stock keeping unit, um, then your offtake is not going to be as impressive as it could have been if you were present in only say uh, 100,000 outlets or 50,000 outlets, but from where consumers were more likely to purchase more of your product. So that's what weighted distribution gives you. It gives you an idea of those stores to, uh, which drive perhaps 80% of your offtake and therefore those stores where you do need to be present. Correct so me if I'm wrong, uh, Sandeep. There are four uh, main parameters. One is your numeric distribution, whether you are present in outlets or not. Second is your value weighted distribution, whether you are, what is the, uh, whether you are present in the outlets which contribute majority to the category. Third yes. is your market share that what hmm. is your market share of all the brands in the market and fourth is your counter share in the outlets which you are present whether you have a substantial share amongst the different brands or not yeah so um the first first and second points we touched upon the last point is typically called share of shelf uh yeah. in in a, in a retail environment 
which is if you are in a single uh, shelf, uh, how, what percentage of the shelf is occupied by your brand's product? It need not necessarily be a single SKU, but your total brand. And that's where concepts like brand blocking, etc., will come into play, which I'll ref you know touch upon later. The market share bit is not it's not a function of uh, the other three variables. Market share is an independent concept because the sales uh, that the sales that you drive are not necessarily only tried to retail, right? Your market share can be driven by your uh, direct to consumer sales, sales from your uh, website as well as from marketplaces as well. But what often ends up determining your share of shelf is your market share. So if you go into a retail store and you tell the retailer, look, I have a new product launch coming in, which means I'll need an additional shelf space. And if I am the market leader, then typically the percentage of share, uh, share uh, of shelf, which is allocated to your brand will be in proportion to your market share. And the logic behind it is fairly simple. If you are a brand with a high market share, it stands to reason that your brand will have high demand uh, from consumers which means even if the retailer were to uh, take off one lower selling SKU from a competitor brand and replace it with your product, the chances of that product having a higher um, rotation, which is basically being you know, sold off and replaced within the store are higher because your market share is higher and therefore there's a consumer demand for your product. There, so you're more likely to get a higher share of shelf if your market share is higher. So. I would, if, if in, in those four uh, parameters you mentioned, Harpreet, are really important, I would focus on these three, the depth and the width of distribution and the share of shelf that you can get within that, uh, uh, within outlet. those four. Yeah. And then, of course, the share by outlet is also important, which will, over a period of time, tell you which outlets are really important for you, which are the outlets where, uh, you know, uh, you're not being able to convert as much as uh, uh, is the industry norm, et cetera. But those are again details which go into further. We can discuss those during the question answers, uh, you know, question session part of it. But uh, how do you how do you define Sandeep share by outlet? Share by outlet in the sense like if you have say two similarly sized outlets within a city or a single format uh, or a single uh, location, what is the output of your uh, product from one uh, store compared to the other? So it's a, it's more like a. Um, now, when you, you say output, is it offtake? Hundred, yeah, output is offtake exactly. So if your share is hundred percent, and and this is an internal measure, right? It's not based on market dynamics, uh, as in uh, with respect to your competition or anything like that. But specifically within your portfolio, is the offtake from a set of stores or a single store much higher than the offtake from a comparable set of stores? If I were to uh, make that simpler, so let's forget it's a, uh, high frequency stores and all. Let's just focus on two big bazaar outlets uh, within a single city. Your products are stocked in both. The share of shelf is roughly comparable, but one big bazaar outlet is selling more of your product than the other. So then that gives you a few interesting hypotheses to work on. Like, is there any difference between the way the uh, products are shelved or the store layout is within those two scenarios. So even the catchment area, I mean, the catchment area could also have a that, that right? comes. Yes, exactly. Multiple uh, items come in. Like, um, uh, what is the geographical area in which these stores are located? Is one located in a more affluent neighborhood versus the other? Uh, what is the footfalls that uh, these two stores see over a period of time? Um, then, uh, you know, uh, the op store opening time could also be a factor if if there is any variation between the two. Is there a, um, a, a theater, movie theater uh, associated with that mall versus the other? So people might be coming in to watch movies and they might think of doing their shopping on the way back home, stuff like this. So this, the, the bigger point is the number of hypotheses you can derive from just checking how your products are shelved and where they are shelved is massive, which is what makes retail marketing a much more dynamic form of marketing than say brand marketing, for instance. Brand marketing, so long as you have got, uh, gotten your brand narratives uh, straight, it's often a question of um, consistency and time to build the brand value that you have and therefore the brand pull. Retail marketing is often not a, a <clears throat> question of consistency. It's a question of how dynamically do you 
change multiple variables and experiment with growth opportunities to see what will move the metric. Uh, it can, like, there have been instances where we have had to change our discount structure going from month to month just in response to competitive activities. And uh, it had, it often had nothing to do with long term brand building, but it had everything to do with ensuring that your share of shelf and your uh, brand's shelving within the stores were protected. Right. And the next two items are basically promotion and price. So promotion is, uh, uh, is, is very similar to um, how a brand marketer might think of um, in driving his or her brand, the kind of communication sector that they would uh, want to do. The difference, excuse me, the difference is often in the uh, time duration uh, with which these two marketers are concerned. Brand marketers think in terms of um, you know uh, semi-annual or annual timelines uh, or campaign to campaign, whereas retail marketers often think in terms of weeks and months. And that's the extent of the uh, thinking that they have, and uh, this often leads to conflict within the brand structure itself. Um, an example is uh, Head & Shoulders was once uh, planning to launch a variant of shampoo called Lemon Fresh in India. Uh, lemon, there were two variants, Lemon Fresh and Apple Fresh. And the, uh, the global, uh, let's say, uh, suggestion was to put more uh, focus and marketing uh, capacity behind Apple Fresh as a variant, as the lead variant in that launch, because uh, globally, Apple Fresh had tested better than Lemon Fresh with consumers. But the fact is, in a country like India, lemon for oil cutting and grease cutting carries much more cultural relevance than apple, which is often which is not a, a fruit that a large percentage of the population can afford on a monthly basis. So there, a lot of people know about apples and have eaten apples, but they don't really use apples on a daily basis. Whereas lemon has and has been acknowledged to have multiple use cases and almost every household uses lemons in one capacity or the other. So the Indian marketing team uh, took a considered decision to disregard the global brand marketing um, um, you know, guidelines and focus on lemon uh, fresh as, or lemon fresh as the key variant in that launch. Because that, their, that decision was driven by a deep understanding of the local nuances and the knowledge where they, of the market where they were working in versus uh, a, a simple brand outlook only. And that, so for instance, I was in the brand marketing team based out of Singapore. And uh, like our directive was, uh, let's try and uh, push Apple fresh further because globally it has tested well. The Indian marketing team took a decision to disregard that and focus on lemon fresh. And their decision was the right uh, decision. At the end of the day, that's what trade marketers have as an advantage over broader brand marketing, which is they are more in tune with market dynamics and the um, retailer trade and consumer nuances at a store level. So that's where promotion becomes interesting when it's handled by retail marketers. Uh, of course, the downside or the negative uh, or the con, if you will, of this is that this can lead to extremely uh, short-sighted views of brand building. So where uh, retail marketers often go uh, and focus only on price discounts and getting into price wars and or uh, playing up those aspects of a brand which are not conducive to a longer term relevance and affinity towards what the brand equity needs to be. And therefore, it always needs to be a balance between a long term and a short term brand building. And that's what experienced retail marketers eventually start practicing. And finally, price and price tables and schemes, incentives, et cetera, are fairly uh, common and straightforward. So these are the four parts of the framework which make retail marketing interesting. And uh, I have tried to touch upon a few differences between retail marketing and brand marketing uh, in this slide, which is uh, with a lot of it have we have already talked through and discussed, so I will not go uh, into detail about this slide. Instead, now, what I'll do is I'll go through multiple portions of the framework, especially display and promotion, and talk through how 
a few uh, talk through a few examples of how those um, uh, frameworks have been brought to life. You'll see a mix of uh, both international and national uh, stores. <clears throat> the first one is actually uh, a technology that has become, or uh, over a long period of time, <clears throat> starting from two thousand, I think eight or nine onwards, started becoming famous. Uh, it really hit its stride in 2014-15 time period and now it's pretty much considered standard uh, approach which is to use heat uh, uh, signatures of um, uh, store environments to figure out what captures consumers' attention. And when, they, when a consumer walks through a store, what is it that he or she looks at? What the directions they look at? What are the kind of messages that they tend to notice? And uh, heat, uh, heat signatures give you a fairly good idea with all the red portions are the portions where a large amount of attention, <coughs> excuse me, large amount of attention is spent on. And um, as you move away from the red portion, the attention span goes on reducing. So, so Sandeep, a, qu a question here. So to capture the heat signatures, do they use those gadgets, those uh, uh, those those goggles with the cameras in yeah. it or does a shopper follow the cart? So a couple of ways, right? Uh, before technology was so advanced and heat signatures could be so uh, well captured, what used to happen was something called mystery shoppers, which is people who are paid by the trade or the brand to actually follow customers through the shop, uh, you know, look at what kind of items they took off the shelf, where all within the store did they actually visit did they face any difficulty in getting from aisle to aisle? Where did they spend time, you know, just standing around and reading stuff? What kind of purchases did they eventually end up making? So uh, mystery shoppers would follow people around and uh, try to get this information. Uh, with the advent of the heat uh, uh, signature technology, what happened is, um, as you rightly said, they would be given specific uh, special goggles, goggles which uh, you know certain consumers could wear and walk around the store, and the data would be recorded. Nowadays, even that is not required because most stores have CCTVs uh, fitted within them, which can follow consumers around. And um, AI and machine learning have been have, are being used now in order to uh, track consumers and build the same kind of information. And in fact more rich and more layered information without having to you know fit consumers with goggles and have them shop specifically because see the uh, it's it's actually there's a there's a, a, a concept in physics which basically i i forget the name of that uh, 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 specific concept but what it actually says is that the very act of observation changes the behavior of the object being observed and that's what happens with uh, uh, you know shoppers. The moment you call them up, uh, explain this entire thing to them, fit them with a, spe a special goggle and all, they become more self-conscious. And, and the way they then shop, uh, the way they take their decisions within the store, et cetera, uh, change considerably. So whereas you get a broadly high level uh, information by using uh, you know, uh, heat signature mapping, et cetera, with the consumer's uh, uh, knowledge, these days, CCTV information plus AI, uh, you know, that actually help you to understand the consumer behavior and, and, and uh, you know, tease out the layers of behavior without the consumer themselves knowing about it has uh, brought much more rich data to trade marketing. On the flip side, of course, are questions of ethics and privacy, which uh, every trade and every brand marketer needs to answer based on, you know, the local laws as well as the policies and the uh, and the values of the organization they are working with. Right. So uh, coming back to this, broadly, IELTS get more uh, attract attention. Special discount messages, like in, on the right side top, you see buy one, get one free message uh, for potatoes, I believe it is. That gets uh, uh, special attention. Uh, it's usually eye level, which is three to four feet above ground level is where a lot of attention goes and when retail uh, when brands try to sell in uh, their product or initiatives to retailers eye level shelving is what they really fight for uh, but of course i mean not all brands and not all uh, skus can get eye level shelving but you know that's where it starts and then as you go to more difficult to reach spaces within the store 
the your offtake will uh, reduce considerably and there are uh, you know several practical interesting aspects to it like uh, if you are a baby product you are more likely to be picked up by a woman than a man and that will result in your product needing to be stocked at 2 feet uh, above eye level where not only can a woman with a typical average height span see it but also reach it menstrual products um, again have to be stacked at the same product uh, level and unlike baby products where women are more comfortable get uh, you know asking for a male uh, employee or a male shopper's help to get something off of the shelf if it's too high or too low menstrual product women are not really comfortable asking other men to pick up menstrual products for them so if they can't reach it themselves they are likely to you know uh, skip that uh, uh, product and buy it from somewhere else so there are a lot of these nuances based on practical observations that come in which uh, retailer retail marketers need to keep in mind while they discuss shelving with uh, the trade going on to the next store so what you see on the left right and and uh, we come to uh, <laughs> with this slide we come to one portion of uh, retail marketing which is rather close to my own heart because i was the uh, i was responsible for launching head and shoulders first ever male lineup of shampoo in asia uh, including india so back in 2012 we had launched a series of three shampoos called uh, uh, for men head and shoulders for men um and this was the time when the only male aisle product was uh, gillette right? there was no male grooming as uh, which had been developed as a category back then today you have a multitude of products you got beardo uh, men matters uh, bombay shaving company and so on and so forth like there are tons of brands that have come up in the male grooming sector space the sector that was in the case back in 2012 uh, now this is not the head and shoulders example but this is an example taken from Uh, a retail store in the us where they had uh, they had an apparel section and the top portion was the or, or rather the left portion from the entrance was the male apparel se section and it had three zones in it the first zone was all the new products um, where the if you see if you look at the top left portion there's there's some uh, the entrance over there the male shopper would enter the store and they would see all the new uh fashionable items and in store uh, which had come in store over there and then and that's that's the first thing that uh, uh, you know men visited when they entered the store and then the the their tracking within the store suggested that they moved directly to the back of the store which is where all the clearance sales items were uh, stocked and then from there if they couldn't find anything that uh, they really wanted they would walk in a straight line all the way back to the entrance and exit the store without looking to browse anything and especially stuff in the middle so the and this is not a, this is a project that was actually done by a consultancy based out of us and what they were and, tasked and and with, women will go women will go browsing through every section women will go browsing for uh, uh, things with every uh, through every section uh, because of a certain reason and i'll come to that um, with men and this i have seen in the shampoo category as well they typically come into a store with a specific intent uh, usually with the intent of this is the product i want and this is the brand uh, of that product that i want if they don't find that brand product combination within the store they start panicking i mean it's not like physical anxiety level anxiety attack level panic but uh, they become lost they don't really know what to do and the typical reaction instead of uh, looking for multiple solutions which can sort of solve their same pain point is to exit the store and go to another store where that product is available this is especially bad in the apparel category because unlike women who can think to multiple options of combinations of outfits that they eventually want to purchase men are Uh, exceptionally bad at figuring out what combinations and what outfits to buy and use now of course when i say all these things you know it may come out as glib pronouncements uh, of uh, of uh, you know male and female behavior uh, please take it with a pinch of salt uh, in as far as 
the caveat goes that this is a representative be, uh, way of behavior. I'm not uh, specifically talking about all the males and all the females in the world. Uh, but as far as the store owner is concerned, that's all you can optimize for, right? I mean, if uh, a large percentage of the uh, customers that you are get or uh, consumers you are getting are behaving in a certain manner, and that manner is not optimized for increasing sales, then you do whatever you can to sort of alter that behavior or reduce the friction points for conversion. At the very end of that IDA model, which we're talking about, you figure out the <clears throat> points within the retail environment where um, friction is causing action not to be taken. And then you remove those uh, friction points so that action can be taken faster. In this case, what they did was to actually, if you look at the top right corner, they put different ensembles on dummies and kept them in the middle of the store where men could see them. So if I were to walk into that store, this is the first thing that I would say, okay. And, and in subconsciously I would be thinking, okay, so these are different combinations that can be used. This <clears throat> color t-shirt and this design will go with that kind of cargo shorts. Okay, fine. Now, if I, now my decision-making is simpler. I just need to find different solutions for that, different combinations for that. And the second thing they did was uh, they figured, they found out that once men took something off of the rack, looked at it, maybe they didn't like the price, maybe they didn't like the design, maybe they found some defect in the product. Then they actually began taking the energy and the effort to fold the product exactly the same way it was already folded and kept and put it back on the rack. That becomes difficult because men don't really know how to fold things back. And uh, that, uh, you know, in, uh, in the, the, the uh, embarrassment that they would not be able to fold it back the way it was kept prevented them from taking and inspecting these products. So they actually folded the products in the top bottom corner. They just folded it in half in a haphazard manner and put it over there. And this actually increased offtake by 40% or these two actions and nothing else, no change in the assortment, no change in the product uh, 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 samples. Now we come to the portion where, uh, which uh, for which I know I uh, I like really love IKEA for, and I'm in awe of them. IKEA, IKEA, however you want to pronounce it. They make it easy for consumers to actually find the things they need to, but they don't make it too easy for them. So if you get into an IKEA store, mm -hmm. you, uh, the way the layout is structured. You will have to walk through the entire store and look at all the displays before you can exit the store. So that actually prevents the kind of, uh, you know, uh, dart in, find whatever you want to, and then get out quickly approach a lot of shoppers use. Instead, you are immersed in that environment, specific smells, lighting, um, uh, you know, in, in some cases, not in Ikea, but in some stores, exactly like what they do in uh, casinos more oxygen is pumped into the air circulation system so that you remain fresh and you don't feel uh, hungry and tired and stop shopping, right? Uh, so a lot of these uh, dark pattern user modification behavior, uh, user behavior modification uh, is employed in a lot of stores and they keep experimenting with things like this in order to find out what combination of stuff works. Uh, if you, like, there's no need to go into that level of detail, but in most, uh, malls, shopping malls and stores which have a bakery inside them where they sell pastries and samosas and stuff like that, you'll find that they're always cooking something. Even if the offtake is not that great, they're always uh, make, you know, baking some fresh bread or making some coffee or uh, opening the uh, beans of coffee that they kept on, keep on the counter. The idea is to suffuse that air with those kind of uh, fresh, happy smells which will entice you to go and at least look at the pastry section, even if you are not planning to buy anything to eat. So that's, again, consumer behavior being used. Now we come to the retail store section where uh, the basic fundamental uh, approach for any brand within the retail store is to uh, do this, these three things, right? Attract, convince, and close. <clears throat> what I mean by that, is that from a uh, distance of 10 feet within a store environment, you need to attract your consumer. And for that, you need big eye-catching claims, banners, designs, uh, and structures within the store that disrupt your pattern thinking 
and attract you to wherever you need to go to. So what you see on the extreme left is what's typically called an end gondola, which is something that is um, it's a, it's a, a, a display device that usually comes at the end of every aisle. So an aisle would be like a corridor. And at the end of the corridor where you will be viewing that uh, aisle before getting into it, you will have a structure which is called an end gondola. And it would have a very strong super claim. So in this case, there's the attractive uh, uh, key visual with the two ladies and the claim of Pantene two X stronger hair. <clears throat> the intent is to attract you from a distance of 10 feet. Now at a distance of three feet, when assuming that you have gotten closer to the uh, display, what you have are those shell strips, right? Uh, in this case, the shell strip is the portion that says Pantene advanced care conditioner uh, advanced care five in one shampoo, etc. So whatever your brand's claim is, will be printed on the shelf strip. The intent of the shelf strip is to attract you to that uh, uh, to the display next level. Mm -hmm. from a three feet, yeah, to the next level. And finally, the closure happens with the product <laughs> itself, where they actually touch the product, feel the packaging in their arms, and look at the price uh, that's uh, printed uh, for the product, etc. So this is the this is uh, the most commonly used approach to attract consumers and uh, you know have them sell uh, have them buy something and this is not a new concept right i mean uh, even hundreds of years ago you would have people in your town fox or uh, town centers who would be hawking wares on the road and they would hold up something from their uh, uh, where it could be a price it could be uh, uh, the actual product and start shouting Right, and like um, come over here, and these are the fresh products or, or fresh produce for sale, etc. <clears throat> and then once once you come closer to them, they would tell you more details about the uh, about the product and why it's so good. And finally, they will help you know let you touch it and feel it, and then talk to you about the price and try and close and convert you. So that's exactly the same psychological approach that's being used in in a more uh, uh, dare I say. Uh, sophisticated context within stores, attract, convince, and close. Now we come to that portion, uh, which I was referring to earlier, which is uh, uh, brand blocking and categorization. <clears throat> this is, uh, uh, categorization is typically done by the trade uh, themselves. So the uh, management of Big Bazaar does it, where they put all professional hair care products together, where they put all men's grooming, men's grooming product, uh, products together where they put uh, women's healthcare products uh, together so as to make shopping simpler for consumers. And instead of having them split across multiple uh, locations within an, uh, within uh, the uh, trade uh, environment, it's best to club uh, specific categories of items together. Um, and then brand blocking is what brands use, where every brand will try to put all of their products together because the design will then because most of the designs uh, of, uh, of uh, you know top-notch brands have certain consistent cues so for instance common you know, elements common elements exactly it could be uh, it will be the brand logo the color uh, the shape of the 3d packaging um, and uh, you know some the way in which certain brand identity elements are represented etc so once you put all these things together from afar, it actually looks like a single living, breathing unit. And that also attracts consumers and it, it helps to um, sell more products uh, because you may have come for one single product and the way it's structured in such a nice visual fashion, you may end up buying a couple more as well. This is where a lot of trade environments try to take unfair advantage uh, of brand designs and usage because uh, one thing which I haven't touched upon so far is the question of uh, private labels in most retail stores and private labels are basically uh, I wouldn't say cheap ripoffs but they are products that are built and owned by the trade themselves and sold at a significant price cut versus uh, you know existing top uh, top end brands the way a lot of stores use dark patterns in order to sell a lot of these private labels instead of investing in growing them as separate brands is to make it look and feel exactly the same as uh, um, brands with higher awareness and even uh, sort of 
uh, uh, shelves those uh, labels close to the uh, top selling brands and that encourages people to mistakenly purchase a cheaper store brand versus a uh, um, uh, you know uh, a well known mainstream, brand mainstream, mainstream well known brand exactly so a lot of and, and you can really fight against the uh, trade marketing uh, sorry trade environment for that because what they are doing is strictly not illegal unless they are violating some copyright uh, agreements and a lot of brands have fought with trade uh, um, uh, companies over copyright infringements uh, which are usually typically uh, settled out of court but the example of how that can damage a brand's reputation is this so if you look at this this actually looks like a clean brand cut a uh, brand uh, block of parachute oil but in between you will see a different variant even though the color and the shape of the um, uh, uh, you know the bottle the and all are exactly fairly fairly similar to each other <clears throat> these are two different brands one is a store brand and the other is parachute a parachute is a ma uh, mainstream brand with a higher price uh, point the store brand is much cheaper than parachute and if people are in a hurry and you know they are not really investing a lot of time considering multiple coconut oil brands and trying to evaluate the uh, uh, differences between the two they might be happy taking something off of the left side of the shelf which is actually the cheaper variant versus parachute so this is what happens when free riders come into the picture so this was all about display now how can you act as a brand marketer as a sorry in this case a retail marketer increase the sales by looking at promotion and working on consumer psychology within a store environment uh, this is this is something that i did uh, with head and shoulders in indonesia which is uh, we had in store assistants who actually went inside stores and talked to consumers when they were about to make a purchase and what we did was to and this was a dandruff uh, uh, brand the anti dandruff brand which basically meant it was a very functional brand what it actually want uh, was to be used to do was to remove dandruff and in this case mm -hmm. we tried to do that by literally showing people in real time within the store environment what their scalp looked like and we used a simple uh, microscope with a magnifying glass attached to a uh, um, a tablet which uh, showed the scalp as you see in the second picture and then we showed them what a healthy scalp would look like once it was washed with anti dandruff shampoo and the fact of the matter is it's not only head and shoulders who can do this any competitive anti dandruff shampoo brand can give you this result but what mattered is the presence of the in store assistant within the store and the way they interacted with the consumer and uh, you know uh, made made them realize that we understood their issue this is the problem that they are facing now and this is what we can provide as a solution and that increased the offtake of the brand and so the, so this is the reason why sampling is a critical element of retail marketing within a store environment this is also the approach that uh, moonshine meadery which is a startup based out of india used to start selling their meats which is an alcoholic beverage drink uh, of, because of the nature of the category they couldn't advertise it uh, in, in a mainstream above the line manner so what they did was to actually uh, they, the founder himself um stand stood outside most of the retail stores over a period of a week and gave out free samples to consumers had them taste it and then talked to them about the brand and you know told them about the characteristics of the product and which actually increased in offtake of cases so that's that's how sampling can uh, you know uh, and sampling the yeah, idea of show don't tell can increase offtake exactly the other one is using consumer psychology so the way for instance nespresso uh sales sells their coffee pods is by looking is by taking each individual pod comparing it to a cost comparing it to the cost of a uh, of a glass of coffee or a, or an espresso which is sold outside if you think about it uh 990 rupees per pod is actually extremely expensive compared to the number of cups and the price per cup you can get from Uh, a packet of one kilo uh, coffee, uh, and if it is you know if you buy it in a, a loose leaf format and make the coffee yourself, 
So that price comparison would never favor Nespresso, uh, Nespresso pots. Instead, what they do is to position Nespresso pots coffee point within the store environment versus uh, a Starbucks coffee or something similar of, of similar nature. <clears throat> and the price points now suddenly start making uh, much more sense. And therefore, by changing the frame of reference, they managed to improve uh, their off-take. This is what Marks & Spencer also did in uh, the UK, where they were selling certain uh, um, pre-prepared and pre-processed food uh, choices. So it's like you would have uh, a pizza and a, a, a small bottle of wine for 10 pounds. And the fact of the matter is, if you were to go inside uh, Marks & Spencer and look for ingredients for a pizza and wine, uh, and buy them separately. It would have been. It would have worked out much cheaper than ten pounds per meal. And therefore, they didn't compare it with other uh, uh, products that were available within the store. Instead, they combined it with the cost that consumers would otherwise have incurred in going out to a restaurant to have a dinner for two. And that, uh, compared to that, the price point of ten pounds was is actually much cheaper. So price is always relative, even within the store environment. And this is where, uh, so this, I'm not, uh, I'm not talking about stuff like everyday low pricing and uh, uh, multiple price, uh, high price, low price uh, uh, concepts, etc. Within retail marketing, primarily because those are academic, those are not dependent on, um, your competition as well to an extent, right? Uh, as far as the uh, as far as tweaking consumer psychology to increase sales of date goes, so that's the reason why I didn't touch upon those. Those are also relevant for pricing within a store environment. The next example is um, scarcity and limited editions. Limited editions is fairly straightforward. A lot of brands create <coughs> specific scarcity. products. Ha, no, no, the the one on the right, the limited edition bit is typically made to take advantage of an existing. Uh, intellectual property that has been brought on either in the case you know type of a movie uh, or uh, uh, Olympics special events like Olympics etc or uh, uh, you know, uh, FIFA football where they where multiple brands bring out specific uh, changes uh, onto their packaging in order to create limited edition products that are that can be sold every year Starbucks brings out uh, a, a pumpkin sp uh, spiced latte during the uh, November period to coincide with Thanksgiving. <clears throat> in Singapore, uh, I think it is uh, McDonald's or Burger King, I'm not sure which one. Uh, they bring out uh, something called an onion ring, uh, which is nothing but a basic onion ring, but it's brought out only during a specific month of the year and people crowd outside restaurants to buy that. Uh, this needs a lot of... Um, you know, background work as far as the brand is concerned in terms of forecasting because once you because this touches the packaging of the product once you change the packaging if nobody really buys it then that's so much lost inventory and uh, you know, i have seen uh, uh, i've seen pantene uh, make that mistake in uh, uh, indonesia when they printed the image of a, a movie star uh, on a set of bottles uh, the day they launched the product uh, the movie star had a, a, a movie launch which uh, flopped and therefore he wasn't in uh, you know, consumers' good books for a while. They didn't really want to pick up the Pantene bottles with, their, with that <laughs> star space on it. So you know, things can go wrong. Uh, so as a retail marketer, you have to um, uh, sometimes rely on luck quite a bit. For instance, there's, a, there's another interesting story. Then th this actually happened to me. Um, back in 2015, no, 2014, we and we in the sense head and shoulders had signed on um, Messi, the footballer Messi, as part of our global ambassadorship program. So he was a global ambassador, and I had uh, uh, created key visuals which I had printed and was going to uh, launch in seven countries in Southeast Asia, saying the world's number one footballer uses the world's number one anti-dandruff shampoo. Uh, it was a basic interplay between Messi being the world's number one footballer and head and shoulders being the world's number one AD shampoo. Suddenly, the internal legal team within PNG asked, asked me to explain why Messi was the world's number one footballer. 
Now this is, this is complex because football is such a um, um, there, is, there are a lot of intensive emotions that rides on, uh, on that on that sport, and uh, a lot of personal preferences as well. Now the way I dis, uh, defined Messi as being the world's number one footballer was uh, using the number of Ballon d'Or awards that he had won. Uh, he had won uh, five or so by then, and that was a world record. And therefore, I argued he is the world's number one footballer. But then the legal team came back and said, okay, did he win the Ballon d'Or award this year? It was that fiscal year that we were looking. And I said, no, I'm going to publish this in December. That award is going to be, uh, sorry, I'm going to launch this in February. That award is going to be launched, uh, announced only in Jan. Uh, and of course, most retail activations, especially multi-country retail activations, take months to plan. So it's not like you can quickly turn things around overnight. But the legal team said, sorry, you can use this claim only if he wins the, wins the Ballon d'Or award this year as well. So uh, my problem was like, how do I predict that? So I spent in the month of December that year, I spent more time uh, looking at betting sites than I did, uh, you know, by uh, of looking at the marketing sh market share of my brand, mm -hmm. because I really desperately needed Messi to win. If he didn't win the Ballon d'Or award, and I couldn't use my claim, and I had already printed a lot of key visuals with that claim on. So these are the kind of practical problems that retail marketers But did face. he win that year? Oh yeah, he won, he won. Uh, <laughs> okay. I mean, it was, uh, it's extremely fortunate for me and of course uh, he is, uh, you know, the talent he is. Uh, so he won the Valentier Award that year as well. That was the last year he won in a throw. Uh, the next year, I think it was Ronaldo. So I escaped uh, literally by the skin of my feet. So that is uh, those are like interesting stories from retail marketing but the uh, the the bigger point behind these stories is that retail marketing often includes stuff that is beyond the control of the marketer a lot of the times your pricing within the store or your promotion within the store is also determined by the trade themselves so uh, a big bazaar store will determine how many months of maximization <laughs> they can allot your brand within a season or within a year. Because if you are, say, representing PNG and your brand is head and shoulders or Pantene, you are going to talk to a trade person, a, a, a store owner, who's also talking to your competitor. And they can't show a lot of preference between your two brands, right? Uh, if both of your brands are like clear uh, market leaders, then they can't show a preference. They will always optimize for whatever feels right for them and whoever gives them better trade margins and with whomever you have the uh, you know better relationship. So uh, they may say, okay, out of six months, I can probably let your brand have uh, you know a freestanding unit within the store uh, for a month max. That's it. And for the rest of the uh, season, I'll have to you know use other brands. Pricing. What you can suggest is a maximum retail price. You can't control, as a retail marketer, you can't specify the exact price uh, that should be held consistent across uh, months and across brands. Uh, it's again in the hands of the retailer. So this is where a lot of stuff becomes uh, sometimes frustrating for retail marketers because you have all these beautiful marketing plans laid out internally which you want to uh, execute. And uh, as far as retail marketing is concerned, execution trumps all strategy. But at the end of the day, the execution is not 100% within your sphere of uh, control or your sphere of influence. Right? There are a lot of other factors that can sort of uh, pour water on your plans. And that is a constant I, uh, 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 level of frustration that retail marketers have to deal with. And then the scarcity bit is exactly as you said, Harpi, the, the point of uh, saying, hey, there are only one more item left in the store, showing only one item in the display store and saying that this is the item that... You know, Apple does it. I mean, Apple does it always, right? Yeah. Apple does it. Amazon does, uh, started it at a larger scale than any other brand on their uh, e-commerce marketplace. <clears throat> yeah. Only one item left in stock. To the extent that they overplayed it, so a large amount of consumers have now uh, gotten savvy to that trick uh, in some cases where they say, that's fine. I looked at this item last week. There was <laughs> only one item left in the stock mm -hmm. last week as well. 
it's the same case today so it will continue to be the same case in next week as well yeah, and they do also use the other pressure tactics that you know this deal is on only for next five minutes or something like that so yes a pay uh, pay within the next four minutes 59 seconds in order to take advantage of this discount yeah the idea is to create a sense of fomo in order to mm -hmm. drive sales and to ensure closure because uh, the biggest fear of any retail marketer at the point of sale is not driving the conversion so, uh, like you have done whatever you needed to do to get a consumer till that particular product aisle and in front of your product. Uh -huh. Now, the only thing that remains is to let them make that final call in order to hand over the money and buy your product. Now, once you have reached that stage, uh, marketing as such is not going to be able to help you a lot. It's the sales driven conversion what ma is, uh, is, is what matters at that stage. And therefore... A lot of brands use a lot of uh, uh, consumer psychology based uh, um, approaches to drive that conversion as quickly as possible. And this is uh, the IKEA effect, uh, which basically says that if you if you have some hand in the construction of a solution of a product solution, then as a consumer, you are more likely to feel more attached to that product uh, and therefore uh, you know, uh, buy it and retain um, yourself as a customer. Uh, Betty Crocker had uh, um, uh, done this in the US a long time ago where they had a cake batter. And uh, that cake batter was a pre-made batter. There was nothing that you needed to do except pop it in the oven, uh, wait for a set period of time and the cake would come out. But the sales were not going up at all. When they tried to figure out why, they realized that most of the women who were making this uh, um, cake really wanted to feel like they had baked the cake themselves. But just taking a mixture, pre-made mixture from a plastic cover, putting it inside a, 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 a plate and, and popping it in the oven didn't feel like they had any investment uh, themselves in the outcome of, the, uh, of this entire exercise. And it didn't feel like uh, they didn't feel like telling their friends that I have baked this cake. So what Betty Crocker did was to take out uh, take out eggs uh, from the pre-made mixture. And then they published this recipe saying, you have this pre-made mixture. You need to add eggs to it, mix it, stir it, let it wait mm -hmm. for 15 minutes, cover it up properly, and then cook it. It was the same thing. Uh, the, like There was nothing different. They, uh, Betty Crocker could have added the eggs themselves uh, and, and uh, uh, produced the... Uh, mixture. Uh, mixture. But what they did was to get the women involved in the production. Oh, yeah. And in oh, India, wow. another brand had uh, has used that consumer insight really brilliantly well. Uh, uh, Maggie launched in 1984, I believe. Uh, and they when they launched in India, pre-made instant noodles, or not pre-made, sorry, instant noodles was a new category. No one had really uh, had instant noodles before in India. So they, they had this uphill task where they had to sell a product uh, whose texture, smell, taste, and category itself was completely alien to Indian customers. And they realized that there was one occasion in the day of an Indian mother where she actually had need to cook food quickly. Which is when they, uh, when her kids came back from school, typically around half past three, half past four in the afternoon, and they were extremely hungry, but they had to go out and play. We are talking about 1980s. Uh, so they, the kids were really hungry and wanted something to uh, quickly gobble down before they went outside to play again. And making that food would have, uh, you know, uh, typically you would have made a samosa or a kachori or something like that. But even that takes time and effort. Uh, and it's coming at an odd part of the day when uh, the other stuff, uh, like cooking lunch, etc. for a housewife um, uh, it has finished. And this is the time when she typically thought of as her meal time before the evening snacks and evening tea and then the dinner time came on board. So she didn't really want to cook anything, or put in the effort, but she also felt guilty about feeding uh, store-bought food to the, her children when they came back. So what Maggie did was, you have this product, but it requires some mixing and tinkering with, right? You have to break the 
uh, components into a boiling uh, a pot of boiling water. Add that um, uh, taste maker. Uh, masala, taste maker masala mix. Cook it for two minutes, and then you have a product that your kids can eat. So this all, and sometimes the, she also chopped a few vegetables quickly and popped it inside. So this actually made her feel like she was cooking something with her own hands for their for her kids. Again, the EK effect came to play, and that's what that positioning is what Maggie became known for for uh, thirty long years. One more example that I can think of is this uh, soft drink called Rasna. Rasna. Yeah. So you know, if you would recall, uh, they you know it was basically you know an exercise in itself. So you know, but it was very. Right. Uh, interactive you know so the whole family will sit together you know they'll make uh, that make, syrup yeah yeah make a syrup and you know uh, uh, yeah, but very interesting very novel uh, you know for those times exactly so rue of sour was, was another example all of these the idea was to make use of the EK effect in order to uh, increase consumer investment in the final output and then um, activations, right? This is a, this is a more uh, uh, common and well-known part of retail marketing in most of the stores where they uh, set up uh, popping pop-up stores like the one which you see top uh, bottom left corner for women, or the kind of uh, really cool immersive experience consumers can get from the Samsung uh, stores. Apple, I think, has uh, is 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 the industry leader in creating an immersive environment for consumers within like their store within a store concept uh, where you go inside and you're surrounded by uh, uh, everything apple and you you almost feel guilty uh, if you walk out without buying anything right and therefore they only go inside that store if uh, if you are you know really sure about buying or if you are really really interested in uh, uh, finding out more about apple so it's also a uh, like a, a really premium looking store in store is a, also a way of self selecting uh, consumers uh, to figure out only do, uh, bring in only those consumers who are really intent on buying uh, your product and then of course uh, at the lower end of the spectrum you have Xiaomi who can sort of paste an entire escalator or an entire floor with their uh, banner and advertisement in order to drive awareness so this is also a, a way to surround consumers with a certain messaging when they get inside the stores. Uh, the kind of brands that really take this to the next level are impulse purchase category brands, where um, you know typically you don't walk into a store to with an intent to buy uh, chewing gum. It's done usually when uh, at certain store uh, points where your self reserve and bills are self reserve and bill is exhausted. Uh, chewing gum or uh, 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 lace, potato chips, and stuff like that. Where once you are tired, you your your self reserve goes down, and uh, uh, rather your self discipline goes down, and therefore you're more amenable to uh, picking up a packet. So that actually brings me to uh, where I think retail marketing can go, and there's a lot of information out there um, with with everyone trying to make predictions about what retail marketing will, uh, in which direction will retail marketing take. Will it even survive in an age where almost everything is going digital and uh, e-commerce is taking over uh, purchase categories? So what I have tried to look at or at least think about are things that I believe will not change ever, which is every, every retail marketer will have to start with consumer first thinking uh, in order to create compelling brand narratives that can help uh, increase offtake. And that's, that's where the importance of a brand narrative will come into play. Consumers will always want uh, higher quality things at a cheaper price uh, to be bought as quickly as possible. This is the basic principle that Amazon, uh, as a company, drives. Uh, you know, that's 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 what they um, hold as the biggest reason why they exist. Uh, and finally, maximizing the way your brand appears within the store is never going to change. Uh, that as a need is never going to change because as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, consumers are extremely visual uh, um, or rather visual simulation works with a lot of, with almost all consumers. And therefore a brand that is presented well within a store in whatever context it may be, will always outsell a brand which is difficult to uh, reach, difficult to understand at the point of purchase and difficult to uh, um, uh, you know, consider the future with 
retail marketing i have only added four points here but i think like a simple google search will give you hundreds of predictions um most of which are uh, you know it, it all depends on the context whether they will happen or not but i think cashless checkout uh, what amazon go has pioneered i think is something that will definitely definitely uh, catch on especially in a post covid environment uh enhanced consumer behavior analysis because uh, behavior and consumer behavior analysis and tweaking of uh, presence of retail uh, sorry stores within the retail presence has always increased right right from the mystery shoppers uh, time to um, let's say specific uh, eye tracking devices to use of cctv plus ai in order to predict behavior uh, they the the technology has improved over the years and with the improvement in technology the nuance of analysis has also improved and i see no reason why it will stop suddenly i think it will only get more and more nuanced um ar vr to enha enhance purchase experience it's already happened uh, so for instance bombay safari is a gin uh, where, where they had uh, experimented with this uh, uh, approach as an example so if you if you had a qr code if you look at the if you pop up on your phone and look at the qr code or scan the qr code rather the brand narrative suddenly comes to life on your smartphone and you can get to know more about the product than can be read from that simple uh, uh, packaging strip and finally the use of ai uh, to create constant improvements in the way uh, pricing is done in the way products are arranged on the shelves in the way uh, the packaging design is uh, done etc will keep on happening and i think that will uh that will be beneficial to both consumers uh, who will get better deals and to retailers who will be able to stock only those products that have a higher chance of rotation so i think that will also continue to happen this in a nutshell is the essence of my presentation and what i wanted to talk about when it came to retail marketing i know it has been a long presentation but what i have tried to say to do a little bit of a summary of it what i have tried to look at is uh, three things the the structure of uh, uh, retail marketing what exactly is it um, the people who work in retail marketing the like retail marketers how how do they view marketing slightly differently from brand marketers a framework the 2d 2p framework uh, which we can use to analyze retail marketing from a high level and within that framework uh, how does consumer behavior and multiple uh, approaches to uh, uh, you know uh, Uh, concepts like distribution etc determine how products are shelved and bought so this was the three sections in in summary i think uh, uh, sandeep uh, more or less you have covered uh, the overview of retail marketing and i won't say just overview you did cover uh, uh, a bit of detail in all of the sections whether what is the difference in retail what is the overview of retail marketing like you said then difference between retail and brand marketing than the framework uh, which is 2d 2p framework and you also spoke about consumer behavior uh, and consumer psychology which goes into play in 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 understanding these uh, 2d 2p framework and how it is being implemented and in future also like you are saying uh, cashless checkout so i think uh, like you said that there are hundreds of uh, trends but these are the most prominent ones whether it That is I a cash like yeah whether it is a cashless checkout or whether it's, whether it is enhanced consumer behavior analysis there could be use of neuro marketing uh, for enhanced consumer behavior analysis ar vr to enhance purchase experience it could be omni channel experience you know that consumer thinks of something and uh, and uh, on a screen an advertisement pops out that this is the nearest store where you can go and buy uh, yeah. so which is ar vr and then ai to create constant planogram improvements that Uh, bases what the heat map is or based what the propensity of a consumer to buy a uh, planogram is constantly evolved exactly and it, uh, i think what technology has done is uh, reduce the time period <clears throat> between iterations of planograms usually for trade it used to happen over a period of months mm. right if uh, for summer season you would have one set of planograms and then you would touch it only during monsoon as in in a trade environment but uh, these days planograms can uh, change based on real time purchase behavior of consumers often on a day to day basis 
and you are only limited by the manpower required to restock items and reshelve items which can also be which may also be eliminated by the use of robots to stock items uh, separately uh, i think early 2013 or 2014 south korea had experimented with um, <clears throat> virtual stores in subways so you would have in in a subway station you would have a uh, a planogram layout there wouldn't be any products there but you as a person could go and use your smartphone to buy all the products that you wanted to uh, purchase make the payment there and by the time you uh, took the subway and reached home those products would have been delivered uh, to your uh, uh, house right so technology can change the way shopping is done considerably and is doing so considerably and that's the reason why it's always difficult to predict where these things can go except at a high level right absolutely um yeah. i think uh, based on the discussion um uh, i and we did you you gave a lot of examples i don't have any further questions because i think this is you have covered pretty much the detail of everything yeah i i i'll just ask one question uh, uh, sandeep you know basis uh, all the knowledge that you shared uh, what advice would you give to uh, you know uh, potential retail marketers people who are interested to make a career in uh, retail marketing uh, any one or two you know key pieces of advice basis your experience and uh, how you see the future of retail marketing evolving uh yeah so the future part vikash is i think is something that uh, uh, it's going to be a little bit beyond my level of expertise as well to try and predict uh, with any level of accuracy but as far as um, advice to young marketers go and and this is uh, uh, why i have a lot of respect for um, companies like png unilever etc because at the outset of a marketer's career whether he or she wants to be a brand marketer or a retail marketer or you know doesn't want to work in marketing at all these companies insist on uh, these young marketers going out and working in the retail and trade environments uh, so to be very open right i i am i consider myself a brand marketer so the other part of the spectrum which is uh, understanding consumer insights pain points matching them with the products and service benefits and uh, uh, features in order to create a brand narrative which will eventually sell the brand uh, those are stuff that i am really interested in but i developed that interest over a period of time when i began my career i began with uh, you know looking at uh, stores and visiting stores every month uh, talking to consumers trying to understand and follow consumers as they purchased uh, behavior i have been a mystery uh, shopper uh myself so that uh on field boots on the ground kind of experience is irreplaceable especially in the in, in your uh, early phase as a retail marketer because at the end of the day see the only thing that will not change is the importance of consumer first thinking right when it comes to ma retail marketing especially so so long as you keep the consumer at the center of your uh, um uh, decision making you will represent the voice of the consumer in your trade meetings in the meetings that you have within your company's board and even if you uh, grow up to be the trade marketing head of an organization for a country or uh, you know the sales head of a country this is the one thing which will always keep you in the know knowing your consumer inside out and knowing how your product interacts with the consumer so always start with retail marketing go to the stores talk to the trade folks talk to the counter of people talk to the in store assistants talk to consumers who are making the purchase at the point of purchase and after they have bought your product and used it over a period of time so try and understand those dirty details initially because those are going to be extremely critical in shaping the way you grow up to be in retail marketers uh secondly uh secondly it's it's more of a behavioral change where uh, i believe a lot of marketers especially from tier 1 organizations uh, who graduate from say iims or uh, mica or, or uh, spg and so forth and you know colleges like that tend to think of retail marketing as uh, as something that's beneath them 
Like they want to work in the cool, sexy part of uh, advertisement creation and uh, uh, winning awards for marketing and all those kind of things. Whereas trudging around in the summer heat uh, across multiple stores to actually go and visit the trade, the stock is the wholesalers and try and understand their problems. Is, is, uh, especially in tier two, tier three villages, is seen as something that's uh, you know a little bit beneath them. So, for instance, for um, uh, Tata Administrative Services, when I was doing a summer project for them, I traveled across thirty nine villages in south and central India, uh, across the Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, and Maharashtra. Often traveling in trains without a ticket because uh, I didn't get enough time to buy a confirmed ticket. I have slept on uh, luggage compartments in non, uh, in trains that went to Nanded and Parbani in Maharashtra. And I have slept in um, hotel rooms with cockroaches uh, uh, in, in a few uh, 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 small villages in AP. I did all that as part of a pure retail marketing project. And the kind of... So if uh, if you were to ask me, will I do it again right now? I don't know, maybe not. But the fact is, doing that at the beginning of my career really gave me more insights into how uh, tier two, tier three villages and rural Indians behave than any textbook ever did. And I suspect any textbook will ever do. So that is the kind of in, uh, experience that you should try and get if it's possible in the beginning of your career as a PhD marketer. I think that's pretty much the only uh, suggestion I have. I wouldn't even call it an advice. No, I think uh, these are very good uh, suggestions, uh, Sandeep, and, uh, you know, um, I think you're bang on. Uh, uh, I personally believe that a lot of great uh, ideas for innovation come from customers. Uh, and retail gives you that opportunity to see how they act, how they behave, and talk to them, uh, you know, and find out how they feel uh, about, uh, you know, their experience about their products and solutions. So, um, uh, what better place could there be than, uh, you know, a retail outlet to talk to your customers and see. And you can, it also gives you an opportunity to check that, you know, what they're telling you is true or, you know, uh, something yeah. and doing something else. So you can right. actually, uh, you know, um, uh, draw real insights, uh, which I think then, you know, uh, can help uh, uh, both the advertising, uh, you know, agencies as well as brand marketers to uh, sharpen the value proposition and positioning statements. Absolutely. In fact, Absolutely. Um, if you don't go to the market, so you will not be, you will never have the ground reality. There is a very interesting anecdote on Kishore Biani, uh, the way Big Bazaar uh, came up with these, uh, uh, with these uh, fashion trends. The 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 lesser expensive, or rather, I will use the word the the. Uh, cheaper uh, clothing options in Big Bazaar was value for used, money. Yeah, value for money. Mm -hmm. He used to make his marketeers go and sit on the railway stations. They, mm -hmm. they, they, they would sit there. Um, that was called ethnography study. They would sit there whole day just observing trends. He would ask his marketeers to be in the market only before they would open their mouth or jot anything on the Excel sheet. He would say that you, you, you just spend your day in the market. I think that's very, very important. Right. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, one interesting aspect about the kind of um, uh, you know fashion that Big Bazaar uh, developed with, uh, with in, in their value for money sequencing is uh, if you walk inside a Big Bazaar and look at the kind of uh, uh, clothes that are stacked in that in, in the same place where I showed the outfits within an Apple store in say uh, Lucknow or Indo versus Mumbai, right? You'll see in Lucknow and Indo, you'll see extremely flashy colors, uh, almost similar to neon colors and bright yellows and bright oranges um, and bright reds uh, with multiple design sequencing on it. And, and you have those big letters like diesel and all written on the back, whether it's, a, whether it's an actual diesel product or not is a different question. But those are the kind of apparel that tier two, tier three youth where to showcase the, and to to show so their flamboyance and show yeah. their character, right? Versus someone of uh, someone in in a similar situation in Mumbai, So that's that that kind level of, I mean, without pushing it to stereotypes, that level of ethnographic clarity on who your consumer is and what his or her preferences are, you will not get uh, unless you observe them. Yeah. Like for instance, you can get this information. 
uh, if you were to just go and visit the first day first show of a uh, first day first show of a Salman Khan movie in Indore, right? You just go in there, buy a ticket, go walk inside the theater and watch the movie, and then watch the people who come over there, the kind of dress uh, uh, apparel that they wear. Uh, the kind of jeans that they wear, the kind of shirt that they wear, whether they tuck in, tuck it inside or leave it hanging out, etc. So those sharp level details of observation, uh, you can't get anywhere else. In fact, uh, to that extent, you know, when you were mentioning this, I don't know if you have seen Rabde Vinadhi Jodi or not. <clears throat> the way they have portrayed Shah Rukh Khan uh, as uh, as Raj, uh, not the other guy, as Raj, the way he walks. The kind of jeans and the t-shirts you wear, that is very, very typical. Um, I mean, they study so much of consumer insight and consumer behavior and consumer research. These small nuances are the ones which make or break a movie. Yeah. You know, look, and, and then uh, Bollywood, the way uh, movies can unearth consumer insights is a different topic of discussion altogether. We can have another one hour conversation on that. Uh, but you are absolutely right. Sure, I Excellent. think, uh, uh, yeah, we had a very, very interesting session and I'm sure uh, the audience is also going to love it. Um, so on that note, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank, Thank, you. So thank you for watching the episode of uh, Marketing Demystified on Retail Marketing. In this particular episode, we looked at what is retail marketing, the 2D2P framework, how is retail marketing different from brand marketing? Um, what all entails in effective retail marketing in terms of understanding the consumer insights and consumer psychology um, and then displaying your products accordingly? How do you price your products? How do you display your products uh, for effective retail marketing? And many more concepts which, which were discussed during this conversation. If you liked the content, please like, do and share uh, for the benefit of wider audience. Thank you.